Stella? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stella Leung. I uh, have been okay. teaching at the PCLL program at CityU for a number of years now. I teach corporate and commercial practice. Right. Stella, your, is your mic on or? Um, we don't seem to be able to hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Mm. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you now. Uh, okay, all right. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll start over. My name is Stella Lam. Uh, I've been teaching at CityU Peace Hour program for a number of years now. I teach corporate and commercial practice, um, as well as um, commercial writing and drafting and professional conduct and practice. Um, I teach the uh, lectures in uh, corporate and commercial practice and I uh, and also commercial writing and drafting and I tutor professional conduct um, as well. Uh, before that, I was a, an, an m and lawyer, or you can say general corporate lawyer, uh, for a good number of years in law firms in Hong Kong, as well as in the United States. So um, very good to meet you. Thanks, Stella. Yes, and as I said, my name is Ubaid. I am a practicing barrister. I've been teaching on the APCL program for about 10 years now. Um, when I started my practice about 20 years ago, yeah, I was a, it was a mixed practice, but over the last 10, 15 years, I've, I've moved more into civil. So just like Jack, I'm doing mostly civil litigation. Um, it was a bit of a mixed practice, even in civil litigation at that time, mostly contractual sort of um, issues and some uh, tort. But over the last four or five years, I've, I've started doing more commercial work and uh, insolvency cases. So it's it's always changing. It's an interesting thing that I think all of you, when you start working, you'll probably also experience. Now, the way it's gonna work today is I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the program for about 15, 20 minutes. And most of this session will be Q and A. Right, so you'll get an opportunity to ask us some questions. We're aiming to go until around 5.30 p.m. Hong Kong time, so it's 4.35 now. If at the end of the session you still have remaining questions, then you know feel free to, to send some emails to us and we'll do our best to answer them uh, in a timely manner. So first thing you might be asking yourself is, why would I want to do the PCL at City U? Right, so you've already heard from two of our teachers. Um, I personally feel that one of the best things about the PCL program at City University is the faculty, right? People who are from a variety of backgrounds who have, you know, been in the in the trenches, who have experience in the field and um, hand then impart that knowledge to the students. We also have a lot of very well-qualified part-time tutors who assist on our program. So students find it very useful uh, to learn from those um, part-time tutors who could either be barristers or solicitors. Now, when you join the program, Obviously, one of the things that we try to do is give you skills where you learn how to solve problems, right? Because PCL is very different from just your know, undergraduate or your JD program, where you're learning the rules, you're learning the law. In the PCL, you're trying to solve the problems that your future clients are going to, to come to you with, right? Because as a client, I don't really care what um, degree you got or how smart you were in class. I want you to solve my problem. The way we do that is through large group lectures and small group teaching. Uh, you know, we have developed 
many courses, which I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. And we use a variety of different methods to, to give you the skills that you will require when you start practicing as a lawyer. Um, you know, when it comes to skills, as you see on this, um, on this PowerPoint slide, how many of you have actually, I mean, it's difficult. Maybe you raise your virtual hand if you, if, if you can. Uh, have you heard about something called chat GPT? I mean, it must be something that, that you might must have heard about. Chat GPT, if you're not, is something that is worth checking out. Um, it's an AI program, came out only about two months ago. Over the Chinese New Year, I had a chance to play around with it. And um, my first instinct was to be, to be amazed. And then, frankly, a little bit scared because Ah, okay, so oh, a few of you have heard of ChatGPT. Now, the reason I'm talking about ChatGPT is, you know, um, a lot of the, the things that are routine can and probably will be taken over by machines, right? I mean, that people have been talking about that for years, and it was only after seeing this early iteration of ChatGPT and I'm sure there'll be many other programs in the next few years where I realized that the future, you know, which I thought was 20 years away or 15, 20 years away is probably a lot closer than, than I thought. Now, how does that impact you? Does that mean, you know, people are not gonna need lawyers anymore? Not necessarily. I think one of the, the, the uh, articles that I read recently, it, it put it quite well, said, AI is not going to replace humans. What it will do is it will take away a lot of the, the, the boring routine, unnecessary work that we normally do. So what we have to do is try to find ways to work with it, right? So, and that's why the skills that you learn, um, such as advocacy, such as drafting, um, providing real practical solutions for your client's needs are going to be very important in the future, right? So you, your, your clients will not need you to do simple uh, routine things. You'll have to sit down, think about uh, solving people's problems and their issues. And that is what we try to, to, to teach you during the course, right? Um, there are components where you have to work with other team members because that is part of working uh, in the real world. And then there are components where you have to do the work yourself. We also, you know, through all the courses, um, identify ethical issues that you will have to deal with in your day-to-day -day practice and how to navigate through those issues. Now, the program itself, uh, if you've looked at the, the um, website, the details of the, of the program are, it's a one-year full-time program. As I said earlier, I mean, we have large group lectures, and then we also have small group classes where you use what you've learned from the lectures and then solve problems in groups. There's also, you know, from time to time, um, guest lecturers, practitioners who come from uh, the professions and they give, you know, either demonstrations or presentations and you have an opportunity to ask questions about everyday um, practice. The courses that are that are uh, taught on the program. There are 11 courses that are compulsory. Can, can you move this slide? Please? So 11 core subjects, which you can see there. You'll do through the uh, two semesters, 
And then there are a number of elective courses that you will have to do in the second semester, right? So you, each student chooses three um, elective courses. We review these from time to time. I mean, this is the list now, but you know, uh, if we feel after having spoken to these students and having looked at the numbers that there is a need for uh, replacing some of, or one or two of these courses, then obviously we can, we tend to do that every couple of years. Now, the topic that you're obviously very interested in or must be very interested in is, is one of admissions. Now, there are a number of pathways. And again, you know, the information, I'm not going to bore you with the details of, of everything that we, uh, all the requirements, but these are essentially the different pathways uh, that are available to students uh, who want to enter the program. And in order to um, be accepted, you must show that you have done the nine core subjects that have been identified um, by the, the uh, Committee on Legal Education and Training in Hong Kong, and then also be competent in uh, the three top-up subjects. Now these, when it comes to these top-up subjects, they, the, they essentially apply to students who are coming from overseas. So we, we, every year we have students coming from England, uh, Australia, uh, and other jurisdictions too, but mostly England and Australia. So you, probably have already started uh, taking your conversion exams and it may have even passed a number of those exams, um, but you would have to show evidence of the fact that you satisfied those. Now, obviously there's also um, the requirement for IELTS, but that is something which again has been uh, stipulated by the Standing Committee on the Legal Education and Training and um, no exemptions are allowed uh, when it comes to IELTS. Again, the details are on our website, so please do take a look. Now, one question I, I get asked sometimes is, you know, how do we decide uh, on who to take? Admissions are based primarily on your results from before and a number of other factors, including, you know, um, the the strength of the course that, that you, you took and the standing of the law school that you attended. We also look at the statement uh, and any extracurricular activities or um, you know, internships that you may have done. Right? so we try to, I mean, there are a number of, uh, a lot of applicants, but we do try to, to look at um, the applicants in a more holistic manner and not just looking at the uh, exam results. However, there is again uh, a requirement, and this is again set by the professions that you must have a at least a two two degree in 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 your law subject. So again, please keep that in mind. And for a small number of uh, applicants, we may also hold interviews. And I'll talk a little bit about that in in, in a second. Now, there is what we call a special track when it comes to application. Now, you, you don't need to do anything yourself on the application form to indicate that you're a special track student. We will look through the applications and students who fall within this criteria then uh, or are identified by us as being special track student. We will then look at them uh, separately. Essentially, what that means is, you know, students who may not be able to get in um, traditionally, we, we would look at their work experience. So if you have at least two years of law-related working experience, either usually it's uh, working as a paralegal or a, or, or a clerk in a law firm, then we will look at your application um, in this special track. And applicants in the special track 
before admission, they will be required to attend an interview. So it's a, usually about a 10, 15 minute interview where the members of the admissions committee will then ask you some questions. And what we want to know, again, there's nothing to be nervous about when it comes to this interview. What we really want to know is what's your motivation for, for trying to join the PCLL? You know, how serious are you about entering the legal profession? Uh, so basically just trying to get to know you and finding out things that cannot be easily gleaned from like your application form. We do have, now there's a number of questions that we, you know, get asked quite often. Uh, and hopefully, I mean, uh, if you are thinking some of these things, I'll, I'll go through some of these topics. So, you know, hopefully I can answer them. Scholarships, yes, we do have them. There are a number of different scholarships. Again, there's quite a bit of information on our website about those. Um, the other question we sometimes get is how, you know, do I need to apply for a UGC funded place? Uh, you do not need to apply for a UGC funded place. You will be informed directly afterwards after the admissions process, uh, whether you have obtained a UN, uh, UGC funded place or whether you have been um, accepted it in the uh, self-financing place. Now, when it comes to, you know, do you need to, um, I think one of the things we get asked is, do you need to apply to each university or each PCL program separately? Uh, the answer is yes, All right? So if, you have to, but the thing to remember there is if you choose more than one provider as your first choice, then all the providers will disqualify your application, right? So you can only have one first choice. So you must put down whichever school you, you ultimately hope to attend as your first choice. Now, what if you know you put down a university or our university or let's say another law school as their second or third choice institution, then we will, let's say for example, you applied and you put us as your second or third choice, then we will not consider or process your application until you inform us in writing that your application has been rejected by your first choice institution, right? So if you've applied somewhere else, as a first choice, put us as second. If you get rejected by your first choice, then you can let us know and then we will consider your application, All right? So generally what happens is we process all the first choice applications and then afterwards we will review the second and third choice if there are still remaining places. The application you know, process started about two months ago. So, you know, sometimes students ask us, oh, should I wait till later uh, after I've obtained all my results? Uh, applications are reviewed on a rolling basis. So, and I think we, we give out our first round of offers as early as March. So I always encourage students to apply early. And so you don't have to wait until you've finished all your courses. You can apply in November even, right? So obviously now we're past that stage, but I would encourage you to, if you're thinking about it, and please do apply uh, as, as soon as you can. All right, so that's essentially all the information I wanted to go through. Um, feel free to ask any questions that you may have. And um, they're on chat. And then I'll also ask, um, you know, Stella and Jack, if, if there is something they want to add, what is the acceptable range of, um, again, this is a difficult question to answer because every year, you know, we look at the whole batch of um, applicants and there's no set sort of, you know, okay, there's a certain GPA and we will only accept people with um, that GPA. The guidance from the, the law society is it's got to be a um, a good, you know, if you, even if you look at the documents from Skelet, it's got to be a good 2-2 uh, degree, but they don't specify. 
So every year, I would say it is actually different. The 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 range is different depending on uh, who's applying and where they're coming from. So, is there any other questions? Cut off for sorry. Do you mean in terms of GPA? GPA. Now we don't actually. One, I think, as a general policy, share that information. But to be honest, even if you ask me, I, I don't really recall that information anyway, if, even if we did share it. Um, do I need to submit my letters? I'm assuming is what it says, along with the application, or can I wait until? No, you, you can actually submit your letters. You don't have to wait until you've been given a conditional offer. So yeah, what students generally do is they send us all that stuff together, or they may ask whoever is writing the letters to send those to us whilst their uh, application is being considered, okay? I've heard from previous PCL we'll try, uh, that the, all right, let me just take a look at the questions. I think the previous question referred to IELTS. Right. Oh, sorry. I think we're having a bit of a... I have a previous... Sorry. Uh, I heard from a previous... Or from previous PCL students that City U... Admissions will prioritize applicants with a training contract offers. May I clarify whether there's... Not necessarily. I mean, my, I've now been sitting on the admissions committee for a few years. Um, obviously, I mean, it's a positive thing. I mean, again, Stella, you 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 have a lot of experience with that. Also, uh, you may want to supplement. Um, but does it mean that if you don't have a, a, a training contract, we won't consider you? Uh, no. And just because you have a training contract doesn't make you much stronger candidate, in my opinion, at least. Anything you want to add, Stella? I think that's right. It 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 doesn't make or break. Um, it's a good indicator. Uh, someone likes you enough to give you an employment offer, uh, but that doesn't you know mean that we uh, we will admit you uh, just because you have a trainee contract. Yeah, I think, I mean, I remember in the past where, let's say, and it doesn't happen very often, but let's say, for example, you know, in the, in the uh, unlikely sort of case where there are two applicants who are very, very similar, right? It's almost nothing to, and we only have one spot left. Then, you know, having the, the training contract may give you a bit of an edge, but again, it will depend on other factors too. You know, I personally do like to read the uh, statements. And there's a reason why we do have the personal statements and it gives us a bit of an indication of who you are. So, you know, it's it's almost impossible to say, oh, just because you have a contract, then it's gonna give you uh, a much better chance. Uh, I, would, I would not say so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, deadline for handing in all the required documents. <laughs> Sorry, what's that last one? The application deadline is the end of April, end of April yes. Um, right, but you know, certain things like uh, IELTS results, then those we will continue to accept until I think uh, beginning of August. Yeah. Okay, I'm a graduate. Conversion exam. Uh, that you would have to, again, Stella, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but when it comes to the conversion exam and whether somebody needs to do, do the conversion exam, that's something that they would have to check with the, uh, the, the PCEA uh, as far as I no, because PCA is the one that would grant the exemptions. 
Right. Yeah. You have to check with them separately. Um, I saw a related question about whether business association is the same as company law. Um, a lot of times it is, but we the universities do not make the call there. You have to check with the conversion exam board. Um, you have to um, you know, send them the syllabus, for example, so they would compare and they would make the determination whether the course that you have taken at your university will be um, considered the equivalent of business association or evidence or other courses. Yeah, I'm actually a, a member of that conversion board. And every couple of months when we hold our meetings, that's one of the things that we do during the meeting. And so we, we they, they, the conversion board actually collects all the applications and then they ask the members to look at the applicants and determine whether an exemption should be granted or not. And the manner in which we conduct that exercise is to look at the syllabus and to look at all the information that is provided by the students to determine whether the course that they studied is equivalent to whatever course would have been um, provided in Hong Kong. So you, yes, you'd have to make an application with the PCA. I, I don't understand. Sorry, right, just give us a one second. Yes, I, I think the question is asking about whether you would only, you'd look mainly at the core subjects uh, or the electives. When it comes to the admissions, we look mainly at the core subjects and the um, if there are any top-up subjects that you, that you took, right? So less emphasis on, on the electives, more on the, the core subjects. A good practice to apply to more than good practice. Well, I mean, I think if you, again, practically speaking, um, obviously you can apply to more than one, and but realistically, the the one which you put as your first choice will be the one that you have the most opportunity or, or chance of getting into. What I and then, of course, there's no 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 uh, stopping you from um, putting the second and third choice and applying to all three. And if there are seats remaining, and you've been told by the first choice that you're not going to be accepted that year, then of course the the second or third uh, may consider your application. But what I would again uh, repeat is, please do not apply to uh, two institutions and put both of them as your first choice or three and put all of them as your first choice because you know we we communicate with each other and and send the the uh, other institutions our lists so that's something that we can check very easily and uh, just last year there, there was a person who actually did that right? and their application was then rejected by both universities I think this is the same question. I think the PCA question. There's a question about the company law and its business association. Uh, what range of CGPA would give me a good chance of acceptance? Again, seriously, uh, there. Stella, do you have anything to add in terms of that question? I mean, I think I've already answered it. Uh, Gray cut off or marks. I, I also saw a related question about uh, this student probably from the UK ask about what was the cutoff mark for UK student last year. Um, well, first, we do not disclose that information. And, um, and we do not have one mark for UK students, uh, because you're uh, from different universities. Um, and we um, do consider the standing of the universities. So having a 65 at University A is not the same as having a 65 at University B. So it is not, not a meaningful uh, information to, to tell you. We don't have one mark, one cutoff mark. And 
you know, we've now received over the years, we've received so many applications from, from so many different universities that we basically have a, a, a fairly good understanding of what one particular mark means uh, as opposed to, to another university. Uh, we have students who have come in from certain universities and it's, it's, it's uh, also something which is useful in terms of gauging these standards and, and everything, yeah. Um, UGC funding. UGC funding is purely um, merit-based. So we look at the, the um, results mostly. Uh, again, there's no particular, um, you know, cut off, it really changes every year, depending on the people who have been accepted and uh, who are the effectively, academically speaking, the top students. Yes, uh, all right. If the PCL conversion exams have been, I'm just reading the question, have been taken, would it still be necessary to for overseas students to um, apply for evaluation letters from the yes, uh, the, that's a requirement. I mean, you you still have to apply for the letter from the PC uh, LL conversion board. But if you've already done it, then that should not be too difficult to do. Do you still review the application if they haven't submitted the um, exemption? I think we do tend to still review it, as far as I recall. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Before submitting the application, no, you don't necessarily have to do your IELTS before submitting the application, but I think I would, again, encourage you to do it as soon as you, if you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to do it as soon as possible, because I remember there was uh, about, I think two years ago, there was a student who, after some deliberation, I think we, we wanted to take and effectively decided after, after our discussion that, okay, fine, we'll, we'll, we'll take that person. And then the, yeah, one of our admin colleagues went to check and found out that the student had not taken the IELTS exam. This was in August now. And um, called the student immediately. And the student told her, oh, no, I still haven't taken it. So then we just had to reject that person because, you know, I was already quite late and we had to make the admissions decision, so. Do I have a chance to get a conditional offer even if I don't have IELTS now? Um, uh, yes, but the condition obviously will be you need to pass the IELTS. Yeah. The number of times of applying diminishing diminish the chance of entering. Uh, no, I would not say so. I mean, I think it it doesn't. I mean, first, I think um, yeah, somebody would have to remember that you've applied multiple times, uh, and there are people. I think you sometimes when you're looking through the applications and you see a name and you think, oh yeah, I've seen this one before. Uh, to me, it makes no big difference if you've applied before. I think um, what I would ask myself though is, if I didn't get in one time or two times, then have I done anything different this time to make perhaps a difference, right? So if you've done further study or if, if you gained some work experience, uh, that might make a difference. And I, I would probably highlight that in the uh, statement that you write to, to tell us, you know, what's different. Do transcripts and supporting sent by have to be originals? Copies are fine. I think the question was, do you need to send originals? No, you don't. You just copies are fine. There will be, yes, there, there will be checked later. I mean, when the qualification checking uh, process occurs, then obviously then you will have to provide the originals and which is normal at every university. PCL uh, 2024, when they they'll be opened, I'm assuming again, November. Yeah, it's always November, so. Uh... 
Yeah, I'm fairly sure they'll be November this year. How many places do you offer this year? Um, I think we're aiming for around 210 or so, but it's again, it's not a fixed number, right? So it's always, the class size is always around that. Is age an issue? And uh, no, not to me. And the other, age, uh, we've had students who have been, I mean, I'm assuming you're, you're saying that somebody older, right? As if young, I mean, is not, not a, are not usually a problem. Oh, okay. There's a. Okay, let me just answer this question, and then Dane, I think I'll I'll answer. I'll I'll hear your question afterwards. So age, no. Um, we we have had students. I think one year Stella again. You might recall. I think we had a student who had probably even retired uh, from government service and then applied to the PCL. So that's right. Age is not an issue at all. All right, uh, Jane, is it? If you have a question. Yes, I have a question. Uh, uh, sir, I'm, I, I've been a CDU JD alumni back in 2017. My GPA is 2.98. Uh, I have several years of working experience now, and my IELTS is eight, and I have applied uh, CDU as my first option. And I really wanted to get into PCL because it really could save my career and make a huge difference uh, on my life. So I really want to know how, how, uh, how big chances that I may, that I may have to, to get into PCL this year. Well, Jane, I mean, I'll be honest. I, I, I we haven't actually, because this is around the time when we start looking at applications. Uh, and we start holding our meetings. So without having looked at a lot of the applications, it's impossible for me to say what your chances would be at this point. But if you've applied then, you know, or I'm assuming you've applied, I think I, I didn't quite hear whether you had applied, but what I would say at this point is just focus on your studies. Don't worry about this process too much now, it's out of your hands. So um, we will look at every application. Um, and you know, consider every applicant. So all I can say is, you know, hopefully you 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 will be joining. But at this point, I, I honestly cannot give you an answer. Well, as a as a as a city you uh, alumni, would that help me uh, to to get a get a get a better chance? I'm I'm sorry. I mean, again, you, um, I would say. How far our students are from our own programs, but it doesn't necessarily give you this, you know, huge advantage over others. Of course, it does help, um, but just because you're from City University again doesn't mean that you know if there are other applicants, uh, then we we would, you know, not consider them. So, yes, being from City U does help, but does it guarantee anything? Uh, I, I, I would not say so. Okay, thank, thank you, sir. Sure. Okay. We didn't, uh, there's a question that says, I'm studying JD, we didn't take business association, does it mean we have to enter uh, NA? No, I think uh, if you took company law, then that would also be considered as a business association at City U, at City U. yeah, because um, it's City U JD, yeah. So if you took a company law, then that's equivalent. Again, that's the next question. So, how many seats would be retained? There's again, no. It's it's not like you know we sit there and we say, okay, before we start the whole thing, um, this is how many we're gonna have for for uh, overseas students. Generally speaking, I mean, again, uh, Stella, do you, do you recall uh, approximately, I would think about half of our students uh, end up being from overseas every year? Yeah, historically, it's roughly half and half. 
but it's not by design or we did not, you know, say, hey, we have this number of CTU students, let's, you know, to, to make it half and half. We never really, you know, make a point of doing so. Um, but every year, the, it roughly fall, um, you know, into place that way. Um, roughly half the students are from overseas and roughly half students are from uh, the uh, universities in Hong Kong, most of them CTU students. Yes. Um, um, Ubaid, um, on yeah. the question earlier about uh, does the number of times applying diminishing diminishes the chance of um, entering the PCLO program. Um, uh, the, you, you answered it that, that no, it does not. Uh, but that prompted me to remind students of one thing. Please answer all the questions on the application. I recall this being the number of times you have applied being one of the questions. And I see students, some students every year omit that question and some other questions. Um, that omitting questions does not leave a good impression, all right? That tells people that you may be careless. It tells people that you may, you do not know how to answer questions on a form. So please answer every question. And yeah, that, that's a useful advice. Useful piece of advice. So, to what extent are UK qualifications LPC considered in um, application? Oh, well, Stella, I think uh, I do not recall seeing anybody with an LPC in the last few years, but did you ever come across somebody who's done the LPC? Um, some do. Um, you know, doing the LPC or having an LLM or the extra studies, uh, those are all factors we'll look into. Um, they do not in any one of them in itself make or break the application. We, we do look at the whole thing. So uh, if you have taken uh, after your LLB, you, if you have taken an additional GDL for whatever reason, if you have taken an LLM, if you have done the LPC, um, that those are all factors. Uh, I think the question is how many UTC funded places are offered? I think again, that's something that the, uh, we have. Uh, Emily would have that number, 50 some, right? That's something. Um, I think that's something that the UGC or the university has actually said that is an internal um, sort of uh, data that the even I think the government does not want the universities to disclose, as far as I recall. If that is not the case, then we can probably send you that information later. But over the last uh, I remember having a conversation with somebody a couple of months ago, and the that's the uh, sort of you know line that I I got from somebody else. I need to ask um, know whether I need to. Oh, I can go up. Uh, need to ask IELTS to send CDU a sealed copy of my report. I think if you ask them to send it, they will send it sealed copy anyway. Yes. But if you're just sending a copy for application, um, then even a photocopy would be fine. Yeah. As we said earlier, your your qualifications will be checked later on anyway. What does he start reviewing? Uh, generally, we'll start reviewing at around this time of the year. Number of times, yeah, this is the same question. Uh, number of times it doesn't really to me. What if my personal statement exceeds 300? Well, you know, try to, to say everything you need to in 300 words. Of course, if it's just a few words, it's not a big deal, but 
if it's 600, then I'll, it again shows you, you that may, you may not be able to put everything you need to put down in, in, a, in a concise manner. So the instructions are there for a reason. When does the committee start reviewing the application? I think this is the same question. Will I get a conditional offer before? Yes, you can get the conditional offer before all the results are in. What makes a strong PCL candidate? And what type and the type that city admissions would like to accept? Well, okay, again, there's no one, you know, prototype, but academic results, they do matter. Um, your writing skills, I think to me, that that, that tells me something. Um, what have you done with your time, right? How have you used your time uh, effectively? Um, what, what do you like to do? Because the, the things that you have done maybe during your summers, it gives an indication of what type of person you are, right? So uh, uh, all these things, I mean, you know, what we want to do is have somebody come in who is then going to contribute to, to the classes. Right, not just sit there and say, all right, I'm in now. That's it. My role is done. I'm just going to go to classes. I'm not going to say a word. And I'm going to, you know, go through the program and just uh, take all the exams and be it. You know, if, if you're somebody who, who can come to the class and engage in, in interesting discussions um, and have the the intellect to engage in these discussions, then obviously that's the type of person we want. It's not very easy to find that on an application form, and that's why sometimes we do have these interviews. But we, we can look at uh, the, the application, the letters that somebody has written for you, and get some idea of, of the type of person you are. Uh, I think some of these questions are pretty much the same conditional. Conditional offers, yes, we will give you conditional offers even before you've met all the requirements. Then, of course, before school starts, you have to meet all those requirements. How many places does, as I said earlier, about around 200 something. Um, when our first round, generally speaking, I think we do release the, um, offers by around March on a rolling basis. But, you know, I think in the past few years, as early as March, but it, it's not fixed. Uh, I think this question is about LLN would increase any chances. Yeah, well, I mean, Stella mentioned that earlier. It helps. I mean, it's not going to hurt. Uh, having an LLM. And some of these are repeats, so mm. I'm just going to go through. Some, uh, for those who want to complete all core courses in two years, leave one semester for exchange, do they need to apply for PCL together with those who are doing three-year tracks? I'm assuming this is a JD student, right? Do they need to apply for together with those who are doing three-year tracks? try to, I, I'm not really sure what that means, but I think this one will note it and then we'll try to send you an email. I think um, supporting documents do the same date as the application. No, some of this, as I said earlier, some of the supporting documents can be sent later. Will both semester results for core subjects be considered or just the better performance? Um, sorry, I don't quite, if, I mean, depends, I guess it, is it a course which has two semesters? Or are, are you saying that you failed one semester and redid the course? It's not apparent. Well, UK legal experience count towards the application. I think, Stella, I think this one uh, is probably asking about the uh, special track. I don't think the work experience has to be in Hong Kong, as far as I recall. It, it can't even be overseas, right? Yeah, that's right. It, uh, it has to be solid legal experience. 
Um, so working in other industries would not count. It would have to be two years of legal experience, but where um, the legal experience take place is not relevant. It is, it's okay if it is in the UK or other um, overseas common law jurisdictions. Yeah, so can I, yeah, thanks. Can I gain admission if I must complete two or three yeah, as long as you fulfill all the requirements and you know an offer has been given to you, then you should be fine. Is there a time bar in respect of LLB degree obtained? I think this one um, is slightly different question because it's not really about age, but it's more about when you obtain your degree. And I, I think we've come across this before where somebody obtained a degree a long, long time ago. And uh, Stella, again, as far as I recall, if it's been more than a decade, then uh, it's, it's not something that's looked at positively. Yeah, um, it, it's not a bar as such, but we'll start to wonder, right? After 10 years, we think your legal knowledge, your, it becomes a bit stale. So it, it is not a good factor, but again, it's not a bar. Yeah, I, mean, I think what people have done that Perhaps what they can do is, uh, if, if, if it's really been a long time since your LLB, then you may consider doing another course uh, to, 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 you know, um, um, strengthen that application. Should reference letters, yeah, you should try to, um, it's optional, but I mean, it helps the reference letters. But if you don't have any, then of course it it's, it's it doesn't uh, mean we will not look at your application. Yeah, it is not required. Uh, you can send in. We'll look at them. Uh, but it should be from someone who know you as a law student, who know or your um, uh, employer from your internship, um, someone who know your aptitude to study in the PCLL program or the, the I mean, your um, aptitude for legal studies. Okay, uh, so don't send us anything from political dignitaries. Don't send us anything from some people in, in high places who do not know you well. So your parents, friends who do not, cannot speak to your um ability as a law student or as someone um, working in, in a law firm, uh, you, you can spare us those. We do not need those. Yeah, I think uh, we're getting down to the last few questions now. Um, somebody was saying, would this PowerPoint be accessible? Well, <laughs> nobody's ever asked that before, but uh, it is a point of pride for me. Uh, uh, yeah, we, I think we'll put the recording and the uh, PowerPoint up afterwards. You mentioned earlier that the admissions would be based on law GPA. Is the same for UGC funded places as well? Non, oh, sorry, for UGC funded places as well, or would that be based on CGPA? I think what I'm, I said earlier was we'll look mainly at those uh, core subjects. Uh, I don't think it makes any difference whether it's uh, uh, UGC funded or not. Uh, we generally tend to concentrate more on the law subjects and the mandatory ones. How do you balance between, oh, sorry, I think this question is applying early and preparing the application. You know, again, this is a bit like, for example, you know, if I gave you a, a test and I gave you a whole week to do it, uh, you have to decide how much time you spend on that test, right? I mean, you may not want to spend 160 hours doing that test. It might just take you three hours of solid work. Uh, applying is the same thing. You don't have to spend five weeks in writing that application. I think if you sat down and you could probably do it in, in, a, in, a, in a day or two. Um, so it doesn't take a lot of time to prepare for it. It's just filling in a few forms and writing the statement may be something that takes a few uh, days, but I would still suggest now it's end of January. So I, I would suggest that you you really if you haven't done it already or started doing it then you start you know putting some 
time and effort into completing that application. Just get it done and you know, then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, can we graduate from CityU, go to another university, have an LLM degree and then apply? Yes, and then apply to PCL, of course. Um, you can do an overseas or uh, LLM at a local institution, another local institution and still come back and do the PCL. Uh, will actual copy of IELTS be needed for verification, although required, not required? I think in the end, you will need to provide an official copy. Yeah. What if electives are much stronger than the core subjects? Well, uh, that, I mean, I think it's a case by case basis. Depends really. I think it's a, again, almost impossible to, how much stronger, right? I say like if you're, if you're talking about uh, a 4.0 in all the non-course uh, subjects and 3.7, I mean, then yeah, technically is, is stronger. Um, again, you know, it's, difficult to answer those types of questions generally yeah, uh, it is. yeah. Um, and uh, I also I want to mention that we do look at trends uh, for people I don't know how many of you in the audience are um, second and third year law students um, if you are first year law students then um, you know be advised that your first year grades do matter uh, if you are second and third students that's behind you now, uh, if you've partied too hard during your first years, first year, uh, we do look at trends. So to, to the question of your electives being much stronger than your core subjects, if we see that your core subjects usually, usually taken during your first year, uh, so-so, but we see a very strong trend. You're doing better your second year. You're doing even better your third year. We see that you are catching on or even though you party too hard during your first year, you got much better. You put your foot down and study your second and third year. So those are things we would consider um, if, if that's helpful to you. Um, no, that's, that's a really good point, I think. Um, and I think it's, it's something that um, I, I can also say something about. Um, you know, and that's something that you can also use your statement for. If there was a semester or a year, perhaps, where you had some difficulties, then explain that to us. You know, use that statement to explain to us why um, you did badly maybe during that year. Something happened. You know, we're all human. I mean, things happen sometimes. So if we see, as Stella said, if we see that, you know, when you first entered university, you went through difficulties, maybe there was an adjustment period, but since then there has been steady improvement or progress, then of course, that's something we will also take into consideration, right? So we're, we're not machines who are just looking at numbers. I mean, we know you also sometimes go through difficult periods in life. So yes, that, that is a good point. Uh, we're getting to, the 5.30 period now, and then the, the questions now, we're just sort of trickling in one or two uh, every couple of minutes. Uh, we'll maybe take another one or two minutes and then whatever is left, we'll try to um, answer them uh, by email. Taking the PCL exam, conversion exam, so the subjects that are not examinable in PCL conversion, uh, is it necessary to submit an evaluation letter for those subjects? Uh, don't think so. But not examinable in PCC, PCL conversion. Uh, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as long as it's indicated in the application, and I think it's been exempted, then that's fine. Uh, why, when do you make your last offer for this? Oh, when should we assume that we haven't made it into the course? Okay. Uh, the last offer uh, is, again, from, there's no cutoff date, generally, but it's shortly before the uh, course starts, I would think. 
Stella, anything to add there? I think that's my yeah, like all the way until maybe several days. It could be as late as several days before classes start, before orientation. Uh, we do not do that on purpose. We don't want to, you know, hold out. Uh, but sometimes um, circumstances are such that we, you know, we um, have to make some last minute um, decisions all the way until end of March. Uh, I mean, end of August. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, that's really just the last few episodes. Yeah. Um, majority of them, we, we try to get it done a few weeks before uh, class. Uh, one last question, and I think we'll make this the last question. Um, already taken one or two conversion exams, would it be suitable to apply? Look, you have to remember, even if you get an offer, you still have to make sure that you have fulfilled all the requirements. So if you still have outstanding um, courses in the conversion exam, then you know even getting the offer is not gonna make any difference. So if you've only taken one or two of the conversions and not taken all of the conversion by the time you wish to attend, then uh, it, it will still impede you, you from, or, or it will stop you from, from starting the course because those are requirements that have to be met. Okay, so I think uh, there's one or two remaining questions. I think uh, we'll, what we'll do is we'll jot those down. We'll just send the answers to you in, a, in an email for those. I think they're pretty similar to previous questions already and we're about five minutes over the time. Um, so thank you very much for attending today. Um, if you have, any other questions that you may want to add or uh, ask, please do send uh, them through um, the email. And um, hopefully we will see you in uh, August. Right? So some of you in August, thank you very much for attending the session today. Thank you, Stella. Thank you. Bye-bye.